The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us for our Stop the Stigma webinar this evening. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Jessica Brown from the Australian Centre for Behavioural Research and Diabetes to present tonight's webinar for us. Uh, just before um, Jess begins, can I check that um, you can hear us okay? Um, if you have taken part in a webinar before, could you please click the raise your hand button on your on the side panel. Excellent. We can see that there's quite a few of you actually who've um, taken part in webinars before, before, which is excellent. And obviously, you can hear us as well, which is always good news. Um, just to let you know how uh, the webinar will pro will proceed, um, we will have around about 15 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have any queries, you can either keep them until um, after the presentation or type the, your question into the chat box or question box and select the send to staff option. Um, you can then submit us and um, Jessica will do her best to answer as many questions as she can at the end of the presentation. Now, I don't want to take up any more of your time, so I will hand you over to Jessica, and I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Angela, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to deliver this webinar. This is a topic that's uh, very close to my heart. I um, have been doing some work in this area for a couple of years now, and yeah, really pleased to be speaking with yeah, a bunch of young people with type 2 diabetes um, and other people interested in that area um, about this topic. So um, without any further delays, I will kick us off. Um, if you, I will just say before I get too far though, that if you are uh, on Twitter and you are someone who likes to interact in that way, you can see my Twitter handle on the screen and um, I'd love to meet with you and um, talk with you further after the webinar. Um, on Twitter you can find me that way. So what I'm going to go through tonight is I'm going to try to answer these four questions. So what is diabetes stigma and what impact does it have on people with diabetes? Um, I want to explore what the factor of age is in diabetes stigma. So do younger adults with type 2 diabetes experience more stigma than their older counterparts? Um, and I also want to talk about ways that we can minimise the impact of stigma. And I really want to keep some dedicated time at the end to hear your experiences. So this is where you'll have an opportunity to um, write in some comments and some questions and I'd like to try to um, address them as much as possible at the end. So just to kick us off, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I understand health-related stigma to be. Um, so I'm a researcher, um, I read a lot of academic literature, I do a lot of um, I, different kinds of research. I'm a health psychologist by background, so most of my research is about people, the way people feel, the way people cope and the way people behave. Um, and so some of the, my uh, ideas can be, um, I guess, overly academic, but what I'm trying to do here is make that um, you know, really accessible for people who have diabetes and understand you know, what is this phenomenon of stigma. It can sound like jargon, so this is kind of a way to understand exactly what it is that we're talking about tonight. So I understand health-related stigma to be a negative social judgment based on a feature of its condition, of a condition or its management. And this judgment could be perceived or experienced and it might include things like exclusion, rejection, blame, stereotyping and status loss. And health related stigma is one of the key social determinants of population health. So what I mean by that is that it can drive social and economic inequalities or it can reproduce or magnify existing health inequalities. And this idea of health-related stigma has been extensively researched and talked about in relation to other conditions. And some, you know, even off the top of your heads, you might be thinking HIV AIDS, mental health. We've also got obesity and epilepsy um, that have had a lot of work done on them. But not very much work um, in diabetes-related stigma. So this is really um, cutting-edge work that not too many people in the world are doing, but I just think it's so important. Um, and, yeah, really pleased to be... Um, talking with you about it today. So I'll, what I, 
the way I wanted to start off was really give you an idea about how I got interested in this topic. Um, obviously, I work at a diabetes research organisation that has strong links with Diabetes Australia Vic. Um, but I don't have diabetes myself and um, no one in my immediate family or any of my close friends even um, have diabetes. So it might be a bit strange that this particular social experience was something that I got interested in. So I, I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea about how I ended up here. So some years ago um, in early 2011, uh, Professor Paul Zimmert from the Baker IDI Institute wrote this uh, article that was published in um, Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and um, other news, um, uh, city uh, newspapers like that. And it was titled, We Should Stop Putting the Blame on Obese People. And his key points were that obesity is the result of both individual and population level vulnerabilities. So what he was saying is we often talk about the role of the individual in, um, in causing their obesity or their type 2 diabetes, but actually the story is much more complex than that and that there's a lot of things going on at a population level and a societal level that are outside the individual's control that contribute to obesity and and associated conditions such as type 2 diabetes. He also said that the media fuels the belief that obesity is caused by sloth and gluttony and that, that many causal factors, as I've said, are not the fault of the individual. I thought this was a fantastic article and I was so encouraged that somebody um, such as Professor Paul Zimmert, who is such an influential character in the diabetes space, um, would write this article and that it would be read by so many people. But what discouraged me was that um, there were more than 200 comments online um, on this article, many of which were exceedingly negative and really um, demonstrated to me that lots and lots of people in society have these blame-based attitudes towards people who um, are obese or, or have um, other conditions like type 2 diabetes. And I've just picked out some of the, um, some of the comments here and, you know, by all means, like this is not even the worst of them. Um, someone said, sloth and sedentary behaviour are to blame. Stop being too lazy to cook a nutritional dinner. Someone else said, selfish people expecting everyone else to take responsibility for them. Someone else said, stop eating those chips fatty and get off your ass." And I was just appalled when I was reading these things and it really demonstrated to me the level of um, unawareness that existed in our society. Uh, about these kinds of uh, about these kinds of issues, and so um, in well, sorry, I forgot to bring those up. And in response to that, um, myself and the director of our research um, of our research team, Professor Jane Spate, we wrote an article for um, an online magazine called The Conversation. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's a um, fantastic online magazine um, that where researchers and scientists can contribute articles, but the articles are written in a really newsy kind of way, so it's very accessible and you can um, read all of the articles full text uh, for free on their website and you can also subscribe and get um, the headlines every day. So I highly recommend that you do that. There's lots of great um, health related information on there actually. Um, and so we wrote in response to this um, not in response per se to Paul Zimmert's article, but in response to the comments that it generated, we wrote this for the conversation, hoping that because this is pitched at the general population, that these ideas might start to influence um, broader society. And our article spoke about things like uh, our focus on individual behaviour change alone has started to have unintended negative consequences in our society. So. It's causing guilt and despair on behalf of people who have chronic conditions. It's resulting in passivity on behalf of governments and it creates and reinforces a social stigma. And this is really the first time that I started explicitly thinking and, and uh, writing about um, social stigma as it might relate to diabetes. So if you're interested in reading that article, you can still find it on the conversation. You just need to search um, for me as an author. 
But once again, um, the backlash to this article was phenomenal. And as appalled as I was reading uh, the comments to Paul Zimmett's article, it was actually even more challenging reading them when it was in response to something that I had written. Um, so I think at the last I checked, there were 99 comments. There may be more now. And many of them are, again, extremely negative. And I'll bring up a couple here for you to have a look at. One person said, fat people have to stop pretending that it's someone else's fault. Someone else said, people can justify their choices any way they want to, just quit complaining about the negative consequences. And another person who actually had type 2 diabetes and was overweight offered this comment, stigma and prejudice is not a negative consequence we should be expected to put up with, and I'm pretty disturbed by the implication that we should. And I have to say that I wholeheartedly agree um, with this comment that I'm pretty disturbed by the implication that um, anyone with a health condition should uh, have to put up with social stigma and, and being lesser in some way. And so that, um, that uh, prompted me to, um, along with my colleagues at the ACBRD, start developing this program of research in social stigma so that we could start to understand it as it applied to diabetes. And the more we could understand what it looked like and how it was experienced by people with diabetes, the better we thought we might be able to address it and help reduce the impact of it. And so that was the path um, that it set us on. And late last year, um, we've published a couple of articles on the topic, but I wanted to draw your attention to this one in particular because it is available in full as a free download from the BMJ Open website. So if you Google BMJ Open and then um, you can Google the name of this, um, of the uh, article, or you can Google, again, Google me as an, uh, just search for me as an author, you should be able to find the full download of this article. And this article reports on a study that we did with people with type 2 diabetes, asking them to explore their social experiences of living with diabetes, and in particular, their perceptions and experiences of the social stigma surrounding type 2 diabetes. And we conducted in-depth interviews. Um, some of you may have even participated in these interviews. And uh, and then we um, brought all of that data together and we categorised it into themes as a way to describe the experience. And it is the results of this study um, that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this evening. Um, now, our key aim of this study was to explore the perception and experience of diabetes stigma <coughs> excuse me from the perspective of adults with type 2 diabetes this was a victorian based study um, but there is no reason to indicate why these findings would be specific to victoria and would not be applicable you know beyond um, the borders of victoria so it was a qualitative study so that means um, we instead of collecting uh, numbers from people through a survey that we collected in spoken word data through semi-structured interviews. And we audio recorded, the, um, audio recorded all of the interviews and then had them transcribed and then we analysed them. And all of the interviews were conducted in a non-clinical setting. Um, all of the participants were adults with type 2 living in Victoria. We had 25 people participate. About half were women. And you can see some other statistics there about um, age and diabetes duration. And I wanted to point out in particular that we had, <coughs> excuse me, three participants who were under the age of 40 years. So that is aged 18 to 39, um, which isn't very many. Um, but proportionally, this wasn't a study specifically about uh, young adults. This was a study that was done um, for adults with type 2 diabetes generally. So we were actually really pleased to um, have a couple of younger ones in there, those who have early onset type 2. So this is just a bit of a summary of the results and then what I'm going to do is um, give you some examples of those results so you can, I guess, put a bit of flesh on the bones. So 84% reported that they believed type 2 diabetes was a stigmatised condition and one woman in particular summarised it really well. She said, I think the stigma is that it's a lifestyle disease, that somehow you've been lazy and you've allowed, a, allowed this to happen to yourself. I think to me that must have come through very strongly. That's the judgment that I think is made. 
Down the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see that some of the key themes were um, evidence of stigma such as blame and shame, negative stereotyping, restricted opportunities, and that there were different sources of stigma that were identified, that there were numerous consequences, negative consequences of this stigma, and people also spoke about these comparisons with type 1 diabetes. So what I'm going to do is walk through each of those things in a little bit more detail for you. So the concepts of blame and shame to start with were highly salient. Participants described feeling judged and blamed by others for bringing their type 2 diabetes on themselves through overeating or poor dietary habits, through <coughs> being inactive or being overweight. And there was this sense that this reflected negatively on their personal character. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm back. Um, participants also said that they experienced self-blame. So they really, <coughs> oh, excuse me, they um, they really felt like that they blamed themselves and they adopted other people's negative attitudes towards them. So one woman said, there's this message that diabetes is this terrible thing that terrible people get because they do terrible things. Someone else said, I find a lot of people, they like to think of you as being the culprit. In fact, I actually had one person say, well, you've dug your grave with your own teeth. Someone else said, I felt guilty in the early days. For the first probably 10 to 15 years, I felt guilty because it was my fault. Almost every participant spoke about the negative stereotypes that are associated with type 2 diabetes. And responses to these stereotypes were mixed. Some people um, expressed concern or frustration or unease about being automatically labelled in this way, while others endorsed the stereotypes themselves. And so some of these stereotypes were fat, obese, overweight, big fat pig, I'm quoting here. Lazy, slothful, couch potato, overeater, glutton, poor people, not terribly intelligent, a shocking person, and bad person. So you can see that these labels are extremely negative and not something that we would at all wish to push onto people. While very few examples of discrimination were reported, there were a few notable cases. Um, and this one here, I think, is um, quite an interesting example. This one woman, um, who stated a strong desire to have a child, described restrictions against people with diabetes who want to be adoptive parents. She was a, a young woman, age 35, um, in a serious relationship, and, and, you know, they, and they both wanted to have children. And she said, I looked up the adoption criteria. A couple of the countries said no type 1 or type 2 diabetes. I suppose if adoption agencies are saying no diabetes, then that's not going to happen. Now, I should stress that I haven't, um, I haven't verified whether or not this is true um, and exactly how many adoption agencies would have this stipulation, if at all. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that this is the case, but this was certainly her, her perception and her experience. Um, another woman said, I guess it did sort of stop me from pushing myself as much as I usually do. So I did leave the position at a time when I was really enjoying it and was hoping to better myself in that position. This was another young woman talking about her experiences at work. So more prominent than discrimination per se was this strength, sense of being um, restricted or having lost opportunities as a result of having type 2 diabetes. And these included things like career, as you hear this woman speaking of here, or limitations in travel, lapsed friendships with people who were unsupportive, um, or even uh, limitations to romantic relationships. People identified a number of different sources of diabetes stigma, but they really saved their most scathing criticism uh, for the media. Um, the media emphasis on lifestyle factors such as being overweight or physically inactive as causal in type 2 diabetes really served to generate or reinforce the blaming attitudes in the community and perpetuate the negative stereotypes and this really elicited negative emotional reactions from people with type 2 diabetes. And you can see some of them here. 
This woman is clearly frustrated as she says, it doesn't have to be from your lifestyle. That's how they portray it in the media. They show all the time there's this diabetes epidemic and all you see is fat people, not their heads, these big bums and tummies. Another person said, there's no good news stories about type 2 diabetes. Perhaps there should be. Perhaps it should be. It isn't necessarily a death sentence. So you can see this guy is, is finding it frustrating that a lot of the stuff in the news about type 2 diabetes is you know, overemphasizing the complications or the fear side of things um, when actually he was living a very positive and fulfilled life with type 2 diabetes. Someone else said, they've, that is the media, got a good way of making people feel bad about themselves. And another young woman said, your feeling is shame, or that's the feeling that you're expected to feel, and that's what those ads were evoking. But unfortunately, the media was not the only source of stigma that our participants identified. Some also um, talked about the role of family and friends in making them feel excluded or lesser in some way. I have to say though, in general participants reported that they had really supported families and friends in workplaces and but they they had existed in this tension whereby the friends and family were helpful, or at least they wanted to be helpful, but a lot of what they did was actually unhelpful or annoying or discouraging, probably unbeknownst to them because they had really good intentions. And sometimes this behaviour was perceived as being hurtful or judgmental or even interfering, and this was particularly in regards to dietary choices and weight management. Um, one person said, to be honest, that's where I've felt it the most is in my own house. His food, her food, and if he ate it, he might have the disease. And probably it has had a severe effect on my marriage. Another woman said, I just say to them, I know what I can put in my mouth and what I can't, thanks all the same. I say yes or no thanks, that makes me feel excluded. I kind of think, they'll think, oh well, she's fat, what do you expect? This was in reference to um, you know, her uh, choosing you know, to have dessert at the end of the meal or something along those lines. Particularly concerning to me was that participants identified healthcare professionals as a source of stigma. Most participants, again, described this combination of positive and helpful as well as negative and discouraging interactions with their healthcare professionals. Some participants reported stigmatising practices and attitudes amongst health, healthcare professionals who were seen to focus on was what was being done wrong. So, for example, uh, an, a high HbA1c or not having lost as much weight as what the healthcare professional might have liked since the last consultation. And this is as opposed to the healthcare professional, professional celebrating the efforts or the small gains that the person might have had. And this focus on the negative was experienced as really discouraging and judgmental. And what people told us was that these negative experiences with their healthcare professionals led to them changing providers or seeking advice from other sources like friends and the internet and avoidance of consultations with healthcare professionals altogether. So um, as one person said, I had one GP that was pretty unsupportive. He wanted me to eat just really, really strict, like he'd set out a diet and it was extremely strict and he was really harsh on me if I didn't stick to it. It just wasn't really strict and that was pretty hard and upsetting. Another person said, the dietitian was awful. That stuck with me for weeks actually. So every time I would eat, say, a little piece of chocolate or something that wasn't perfectly nutritious, I would think of her and I don't think these medical or health professionals know what an impact they can have. I do want to say that I'm not into health professional bashing. Um, this is, I'm a health professional myself and this has been really enlightening to me and I've been working with um, a number of different healthcare professionals since we've had this data. Um, I did a, a webinar for um, dietitians and nutritionists just last week actually on this topic, um, helping them understand about um, the ways in which their, their behaviour and comments might be interpreted negatively by people with type 2 diabetes and how it could actually be counterproductive in some ways and I'm convinced that most people have really good intentions, most health professionals do. Um, they got into the profession after all because they wanted to help people but I, I do think sometimes it's hard for health professionals to 
um, have a full appreciation of what the experience is like on, when you're on the other side of the table or the desk. So this is something that um, we are actively working on and working with health professionals to um, help them uh, and equip them to help mitigate this stigma in their clinical settings. So I want to talk a little bit now about the consequences of um, of this stigmatization for people with type 2 diabetes. And I wonder if, as I've been talking, some of these quotes or experiences that I've been describing have been really familiar to you. Um, and I'm also curious to know how you might have been impacted by, um, by those experiences and what kinds of consequences has it had for you personally. But before we talk about that I'll tell you what our participants said and then you can reflect on whether or, or how similar that was to or has been to your experiences. So one of the key consequences of stigmatization was um, non-disclosure. So this is people really wanting to keep their type 2 diabetes a secret and not wanting to share it with those around them, um, not wanting people to know. So some of the key reasons for this non-disclosure were fear of being judged or blamed for having type 2 diabetes or having this overwhelming sense of self-blame. <clears throat> some also described a fear of being discriminated against or a desire to distance oneself from society's negative portrayals of people with diabetes. Another reason included not wanting to deal with people's misconceptions about the, about the condition and not wanting to answer lots of questions about diabetes, but also not wanting to worry people or shock people and not wanting to attract sympathy. And this was particularly true in romantic relationships and in workplaces. So as one person said, when I first got it, I wouldn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell my husband. I told nobody. I actually felt so ashamed to have diabetes. I felt completely ashamed of myself. Another person commented, I think the problem was more in corporate life. I was in a very senior role and I felt the need to hide it. This is a really interesting one here. This gentleman said, apart from me, none of the people I know who have diabetes ever say that they have diabetes. They never say it. They never say a word. And I reckon it's because the messages that are put out there by our national patient organisation are shutting them up because they're hurt and mortified. So this, again, is really pointing to the role of health professionals and organisations such as Diabetes Australia to really lead the way in, um, in responsible messaging about type 2 diabetes. And once again, we've been working really closely um, with organisations to help inform their health promotion messages around type 2 diabetes, which we hope in time will have an impact back on the community and society more broadly. So as you've perhaps experienced yourself, this, um, this feeling of not wanting to disclose your diabetes or not, letting, not wanting to let other people know that you have diabetes can impact on your self-care regimen. So there might be a reluctance to modify one's diet in a social setting or it might prevent or delay essential self-management tasks such as checking blood glucose or taking medication or injecting insulin if you're using insulin. It may even lead to an unwillingness to commence insulin, even if that is the best treatment option available for you at the time, because uh, people have a perception that once they go onto insulin, it's going to be much harder to hide their type 2 diabetes, particularly in the workplace. And all of these things can lead to high blood glucose, that is hyperglycemia. And as we all know, this increases the risk of complications and can just lead to a general feeling of unwellness in your day-to-day -day life if your blood glucose levels are consistently quite high. So we can see here where um, we look at the stigmatization of type 2 diabetes, which is resulting in people wanting to hide their diabetes, which is resulting in people not caring for their diabetes as best as they could, which may lead to increased risk of complications. So we can see here that there is a link between stigma, well, you know, potentially a link between 
uh, stigmatization and the um, health and well-being outcomes of people with diabetes. And to me, this is an excellent rationale for continuing to do more work and research in this area. We need to be able to reduce this stigmatization so that the impact on self-care and, and long-term health can be minimized. One of the other key consequences of stigmatization is emotional and psychological dis distress. So this included feelings like shame, guilt, regret, and even hopelessness. Um, other things that were noted were self, uh, low self-worth and low self-confidence. And some participants, as I've mentioned before, felt that having type 2 diabetes reflected really poorly on their personal character. And having this psychological distress made it even harder for them to cope with and adjust to life with type 2 diabetes. You can see a couple of examples here. One woman commented, I call it the blame and shame disease because I think that people get blamed and shamed and I think that makes it worse. They feel hopeless. Another woman spoke of feeling inferior while another said there was guilt. I felt confused. I felt a great sense of loss as though my health was gone. So here we almost see her talking about um, grief, that she had to mourn the loss of her health, which is a, another element of the psychological and emotional distress that was evidenced. And I just want to touch really briefly on um, type 1 diabetes. So we didn't talk explicitly with the people with type 2 diabetes about type 1 diabetes, um, but many of them brought up that they felt that the stigmatization of diabetes was specific to people with type 2 diabetes and that those with type 1 were not judged so harshly. And the main reason suggested for this was that those with type 1 were not perceived to be at fault or to have done anything to cause their condition, whereas society perceived people with type 2 to have in quotations, brought the condition on themselves. And you can see a couple of quotes here. One person says, type 1 is you poor thing, type 2 is you stupid thing. Another quote, they, that is people with type 1, have access to pumps, they have heaps of support groups and workshops. If I tried to get into the same type of thing because I'm on insulin, they say no because you're type 2. So they automatically exclude you just because of your diagnosis. So that segregates the diabetes community as a whole. <clears throat> at when, um, many of you might know that at, in December of 2013, we have the International Diabetes Federation World Diabetes Conference here in Melbourne. And at that conference, I presented a, a similar study, but actually interviews with people with type 1 diabetes. Um, and it was clear to me that from that data that people with type 1 diabetes also feel stigmatized. Um, so this isn't something that just affects people with type 2, it does affect people with type 1 as well. Um, so it could be an opportunity for people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes to, to band together and in that unity present a, yeah, this united voice and united front to try to speak out against this stigma. So I know many people uh, think that age is just a number. Uh, age is clearly a word, but beyond that, it actually is something that can be really important in terms of the experience of type 2 diabetes and the diabetes management. And I just want to talk about that briefly in terms of social, um, in social stigma in diabetes. So we know this is stuff that I'm sure um, you're familiar with, but we know that the mean age of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is falling rapidly. And we also know that there are around 7,000 people aged 18 to 39 with type 2 diabetes in Victoria alone. So this really is a growing group. We know that younger adults are more susceptible to experiences and consequences of type 2 diabetes stigma than uh, older than their older counterparts. And we know this from two different studies. We know this, first of all, from the study that I've just been talking about, but also from a previous study that myself and my colleagues have done that was a survey of young adults with type 2 diabetes. And that survey found that 52% of young adults felt blamed by others for bringing the condition on themselves. 40% feel ashamed for having type 2 diabetes. 39% try to hide their diabetes in social situations, and a third believed that their healthcare professionals did not understand the needs and concerns of younger adults with type 2 diabetes. 
So this does not paint a particularly positive picture, actually. And in the study that I've been um, describing, the interview study today, the younger adults, and there were only three of them, so we can't hang our hat on this too much, but by obs my observation is that the younger adults um, described more awareness or experience of stigmatization. And some of my ideas about why this might be true include the fact that it's not as common amongst younger people as older people. Some of the older people that we spoke to said things like, well, I don't really think type 2 diabetes is stigmatized. You know, all of my friends have some kind of health condition. Mine's type 2 diabetes. You know, the next guy has this, the next guy has that. So this chronic nature of um, the health problem was really normed in their friendship groups. Whereas if you're in your 20s or your 30s with type 2 diabetes, chances are you know very few other people uh, your age with type 2 diabetes. But I also think that younger people with type 2 are exposed to more situations given their life stage where the stigmatization could be a problem. For example, workplace, dating relationships and starting a family are just three off the top of my head. There are probably many more. Whereas if you're older in your 60s, probably you're not working anymore. Um, probably you're not active on the dating scene and you're certainly not looking to start a family. So um, these are situations that older people who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are somewhat protected from, I guess. So I want to spend our remaining time really talking about what you can do to address and cope with diabetes-related stigma. As I said before, some of these experiences may be familiar to you. Some of them may be very different to what you've experienced. And that's okay too. Everyone has a very unique experience of living with type 2 diabetes. But if this is you and this is, if this is something that you feel like you have experienced or you have struggled with either now or in the past, I want to um, make some suggestions now about what you can do to address um, the social stigmatization of type 2 diabetes. And my first suggestion is to simply get connected because I really believe that isolation is the enemy. Um, you don't want to end up in a place where you feel like you're the only person carrying this burden. So my suggestion would be to get connected with a community of younger adults with type 2 diabetes. Now, given you're on this webinar right now, probably you already are somewhat connected with whether it be Diabetes Australia Vic or specifically um, their Generation T2 events such as this. Can I also encourage you to um, follow this link and jump onto this Facebook group that's moderated by Ashley and Lou, who are two um, excellent uh, leaders in this space, um, young, young women with diabetes who are really seeking to try to bring people together. So um, jump on that group and you can use that to share your experiences and connect with other people. And um, another suggestion that I really want to commend to you is getting involved in OzDoc. So this is a community of people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, who uh, gather together on Twitter for weekly um, tweet chats. And as it so happens, their next tweet chat is actually tonight at 8.30, and the topic is also on stigma. So this will be um, moderated by the lovely Kim Henshaw. And so my suggestion would be is if you're enjoying this conversation and you want to continue to interact with people on this topic, Follow that link, jump over to Twitter, search for OzDoc and take part in their, um, in their Twitter chat. You, if, this is, um, if you're new to tweet chats or to Twitter generally, you don't have to be active immediately. You can just sit there and watch what other people are saying. So that's 8.30 tonight and I, um, I strongly commend that to you. So by doing these and, and other things where you can connect with peers, it can help you remember that you're not the only one that's experiencing this, but it can also help to develop a united voice for change, which I think is really important. And this quote always sticks with me. Professor Ed Fisher is from um, the US and he is an expert on peer support in diabetes. And he was once reflecting on this um, landmark study conducted by House in 1988. And his conclusion from reading that study was that an absence of peer support is as bad for you as smoking. So if that's not a recommendation to get connected with some other people, um, other young people with type 2 diabetes, then I really, I don't know what is. I also want to say that you should avoid self-stigmatizing. You are not your condition and blaming yourself 
or accepting blame from others is completely unhelpful. Um, this can lead to feelings of hopelessness where you feel like there's nothing that you can do about it now. And I, I just want to say that I think this is false, um, that I don't think blaming, or blaming and shaming is productive in any way, um, that I believe and we know from the science that the causes of type 2 diabetes are many and complex. Um, and it doesn't just come down to individual behaviour. So I would encourage you that if this is you, to relieve yourself of that burden. And I'd encourage you to think through what you do have control over and what you don't have control over. So at this point, you may be a young person diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And what you may not have control over is the media messages about type 2 diabetes or the things people say to you about type 2 diabetes. But what you do have control over is who you surround yourself with and what your response to those things might be. I would also encourage you to look forward and consider what can you do now to manage your diabetes as best as you can for your future health. Staying in a realm of hopelessness where you feel like there's nothing that can be done now is, it, first of all, it's simply untrue. There is much that you can do now to contribute to your future health. Um, and secondly, it's also really unhelpful because it feels as though you will be powerless over your condition when you are not. There are many things that you can do to improve your future health. So find out what they are, talk to your healthcare professional and, and um, seek support in doing them. I would also suggest that educating other people around you might go some way to reducing the societal stigmatisation of diabetes. So my belief is that the stigmatisation and discrimination stem from a lack of understanding in the community. And it was once said that nothing combats stupidity like science. So the better educated you are about the facts of type 2 diabetes, the better you can help other people understand what it's like to live with type 2 diabetes, why um, people get type 2 diabetes and what can be done to manage type 2 diabetes. So I would say that it is you, uh, you who are living with the condition have the most power to enhance others' understanding of the condition. And some helpful messages that you might consider, you know, talking casually with your <laughs> family and friends about if it comes up. Help them understand that the causes of type 2 diabetes are many and complex. Help them understand that it runs in families. Uh, and help them understand that a lot of the things that you do to manage your diabetes are exactly the same things that they would do to improve their health, like uh, getting some more exercise, being more physically active, um, changing their dietary patterns. These are many of the same things that all of us need to be doing to um, improve our, our health both now and in the future. So, yeah, you know, I really want to leave you with that message that the more educated about type 2 diabetes you are, the better equipped you are to help others understand. But I do want to put a bit of a proviso on this. Sometimes you just don't have the energy to start from scratch with someone and walk them through all of the specifics of type 2 diabetes and answer all of their questions. And that's fine. You know, use your common sense about who you invest that time in and, and whether or not you have the energy to do that on a certain day versus the next day. So I would say that this is not a, um, this is not a command, it's just something that you might consider to be appropriate in some situations. And finally I would say to speak out. I really think that sticking your neck out can be difficult but my suspicion is that it would only take a couple of people to be more vocal on this issue and then thousands of others will be grateful that you did and then it will give others the courage to speak up in turn. So I think it, um, this is a really uh, important and interesting way that you could show leadership in this space. So some ideas that I had and you might have other ideas are to write a letter to the editor of newspapers or diabetes magazines, participate in online forums such as the OSDOC that I mentioned before. Contact organisations to give feedback about their programs or their services or campaigns and ask them for what you want. And also consider taking part in research as a way to make your voice heard and then because that data is then used to inform policy and practice. So unless you take part, we don't know what it is that you need or want. But I would also say 
Once again, a bit of a disclaimer, disclose at your discretion. Sometimes you might not feel like it's safe. Sometimes it is sensible to keep it to yourself. Um, this is not uh, a command to go forth and broadcast from the rooftops, but rather an encouragement to, um, yeah, to, to, to be bold when it is appropriate. I just want to take another couple of moments to talk a little bit more about taking part in research. So um, diabetes research has been going on for decades and we know very little about the, as a, about the best way to manage type 2 diabetes in younger adults. While there's been heaps of stuff going on in the past, this is not an area where a lot of stuff has been done. So we know almost nothing about how best to deliver health care to you. And the only way that's going to change is if younger adults with type 2 diabetes volunteer for research studies. So my encouragement to you is make it your hobby. Um, there are a bunch of ways that you can get involved in different research studies. One is to go to um, my search um, my research centre's website, so I work for the Australian Centre for Behavioural Research in Diabetes. Um, you can sign up for our e-newsletter and then you will get notifications of our calls for research. There's also um, a page on the Diabetes Australia VIC website where you can learn about clinical trials going on in your area. And um, this uh, final um, web link that I have there is a patient-run um, forum where people can um, nominate the kinds of research that they want to be involved in and, and get connected with that research. Another good way is also to ask at your diabetes clinic or GP practice. Um, because that will also encourage them as a practice to take part in new research where you might have access to new technologies or new ways of managing your diabetes. So that's a really important thing as well. If they know that their patients are interested in taking part in research, then they might be more likely to adopt different research programs in their practice. So um, at the moment, I know of one um, great study that you might be interested in getting involved in and one of the key reasons you might be interested in getting involved is actually that you have a excellent chance of winning an iPad mini. So if you're interested in um, winning an iPad mini then you can take part in this um, in this study. So it's about eye health and diabetes and it's about preventing complications that matter to you. So this is actually a phone interview so you don't have to go anywhere, you can do it at a time that suits you and this is for uh, young adults with type 2 diabetes who are living in Victoria. So if you're interested you can see the contact details up on the screen there, contact Amelia Lake um, and she would be happy to um, talk more with you about that. And Even if you don't want to take part in the study but you'd like to discuss research with her generally, um, you can still send her an email or give her a call and, um, and she can help you out more with that. So just in closing I want to add some final notes. Um, about where you can get more support if you need it. If you feel like the um, stigmatisation has been getting to you and you are struggling a bit emotionally with that, I've got just a couple of ideas about places where you could go to get some additional support. And the first would be the Diabetes Australia Vic website. Um, Diabetes Australia Vic has an advocacy team and service that can help you with um, any kinds of discrimination issues that you feel like you might have faced. So I encourage you that if that's you, to jump on that website. There's also this great service called Diabetes Counselling Online. Um, and this is a great way to anonymously, lar largely anonymously, <coughs> receive counselling and, and emotional help for problems that you might be experiencing specifically re in relation to diabetes. Uh, the health professionals who run this site both have diabetes and are trained counsellors and health professionals. So um, I really uh, I think this is a great service and if you think you could benefit from that, I would encourage you to jump onto that website. Another great resource is this booklet that's been put together by SANE and Diabetes Australia about good mental health for people affected by diabetes and that's a free download. Um, oh, sorry, it's not a download, it's a, you have to order it in hard copy but you can do that for free um, from that website there. 
And many of you will be familiar with Beyond Blue, um, which is a depression and anxiety organisation, and they have a lot of different um, e-resources, and yeah, they run a lot of things in the community to try to actually address the stigmatisation of mental health problems, which I think is a really great initiative as well. So you can find out a lot of information about depression and anxiety more generally on this website. And finally, if your emotional health is something that you feel like you would like to talk to a healthcare professional about, so perhaps your GP or your diabetes educator, but you don't quite know how to start the conversation, this tool could be really useful. It's a re really quick questionnaire that you can do online. It's called Minding Diabetes. And then you get a bit of a printout that summarizes how your, um, you know, what summarizes your responses. And then you can take that printout along to your next appointment with your healthcare professional so that you can use that as a talking point to discuss um, how you're feeling emotionally about your diabetes. So on that note, I'm going to stop talking for a little while and just start to take a look at some of the questions that you guys have been sending through. So um, Angela has been compiling those for me. So I've got a whole bunch here and we'll see how many we can get through. So the first question that has come through is, how do I respond when people say it's my fault I have diabetes because I'm overweight? First of all, I would say I'm really sorry that you've had that experience, um, but you are not alone in having that experience. Um, I, would, I like personally, I like to help people understand that the causes of type 2 diabetes are many and complex. Uh, that there is a strong genetic component, that it's not just our individual behaviour and lifestyle, and also that our society makes it, the way our society is set up and our environment is set up, it's really hard to do healthy things. Unhealthy food is cheaper than healthy food. Um, being sedentary is much harder than being active because of the nature of the jobs that many of us have. So I would help people to understand the broader societal factors that can contribute to unhealth in all of us and help them understand that there are lots of different things that cause type 2 diabetes. Um, don't accept their blame. Um, being argumentative is probably not helpful either. That's just going to use way too much energy for you and it's not going to make you feel any good. But it's important that people know um, that just because you might have a health condition, that that doesn't mean that they, that they can uh, speak this negative stuff into your life. This is not a license for people to um, give, dish out their opinions freely. So create your own boundaries, know what you are and aren't going to talk to people about and have some rote responses ready when people say something that you don't agree with or you don't think is particularly helpful. So I think that's a really good question, but I don't have an easy answer, unfortunately. Uh, the next question that's come through is, I get embarrassed by media reports that focus on type 2 people being overweight. How can I get people to understand that it's not all about diet? Yeah, so this is, um, I hope my previous response uh, helped to address that a little bit. I, I completely agree with you that the media reports are unhelpful. I think um, often the way we see type 2 diabetes in the media is this overemphasis on individual responsibility in terms of um, eating behaviours and physical activity. Now, we all know that healthy eating and physical activity contributes to our health, regardless of whether we have type 2 diabetes or not. But the emphasis that the media has solely on that really serves to reinforce this stigmatisation and this blame that people have. <clears throat> so what I would say is to, if there is something in the media that has um, displeased you in this way, I strongly encourage you to get in touch with the media source. So whether that be the editor of the newspaper, um, whether that be the diabetes organisation that you saw it come from, whether that be um, the principal at the school that you saw this at, I would strongly encourage you to go to the source and give your feedback. Again, not in an argumentative or an emotive way, but as I said before, one of the you know, the best cure for stupidity is science. So go there really well equipped with the facts and present back to them uh, that perhaps their view of or their description of the causes of type 2 diabetes 
was uh, lacking in detail and nuance and um, point them to the science, point them to the resources that explain the different causes of type 2 diabetes. And you can find a lot of that information on the Diabetes Australia Vic website and if you get in touch with me I'm also happy to help you out with more information about that. So I hope that's a helpful tip. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I'm worried about people at work finding out I have type 2 diabetes. I don't tell anyone and it is difficult not to talk about it. Do I have to let my employer know or can I keep it quiet? This is an excellent question and a really common concern for people with type 2 diabetes generally. Um, I am not on top of the legislation in this regard. Um, so I can't give you the legal advice, that's not my background, but people who can give you the advice about what is required of you is the advocacy team at DAVIC. So if you want to know what your um, employee rights and responsibilities are, you can go to the advocacy team at Diabetes Australia Vic. I also know that they have produced a really good um, brochure that summarises your legal rights and responsibilities in the workplace, which you can download from the Diabetes Australia Vic website. Um, the w workplaces can be really hard. Um, I've spoken to people who have shared their diagnosis in the workplace and and the response has been extremely positive and supportive but unfortunately there's also been a small number of cases that I have heard of or I know about personally um, where it hasn't gone quite so well but if you really do want to share this in your workplace perhaps not with everyone but with a few key people such as you know the first aid officer or um, or your boss then there are ways that Diabetes Australia Vic can help you do that in a way that is um, that is safest for you. So my advice would be to um, contact the advocacy team at Diabetes Australia Vic and download the brochure that they have. The next question is where can I get involved in support groups for young people with type 2 diabetes? Yeah, this is an excellent question. We know that this is a, a gap um, and it's something that we really uh, want to address and I know Diabetes Australia Vic really wants to address as well. Um, what we've had some trouble with I guess is that even when we, uh, even when things have been started, it's, um, people haven't always kind of come out of the woodwork and gotten involved. So my encouragement would be to get involved in anything that you do see happening because the more um, participation there is in each event, the more likely that there is to be another event. Um, and then I also gave some um, tips about how to connect with other young people with type 2 diabetes um, you know, through the Generation T2 event. So Angela would be happy, I'm sure, to update you on any plans that um, she has about growing the support group offering for young adults with type 2 diabetes in Victoria. So definitely contact Angela about that and she'll be able to update you and point you in the right direction. But then we've also got OzDoc and that Facebook group that I mentioned. So there are a, a number of different ways that you might be able to connect with other people your age with type 2 diabetes. Uh, next question, do you think more work needs to be d done to educate both types about each other and how would you suggest we do this? Yeah, I think this is an excellent idea. Um, I, as I said a little earlier on, I think stigmatization is something that both um, that people from but with both types of diabetes do experience and this is potentially an issue where people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes can um, come together and present a united front. Certainly when I talk to people with type 1 diabetes I try to also um, share some of the issues faced by people with type 2 diabetes and vice versa um, but we do also know that they are very different conditions with different experiences and we don't want to assume that they're the same. So yeah, it really is important that if you um, have the opportunity to connect with and interact with people with type 1 diabetes, that you really sit and listen to them and hear what their experience is like in the same way that you would hope that they would sit and listen to you and come to understand what your um, experience is like. So we've still got lots more questions coming through. Um, we've probably just got time for two more, so I'm just going to have a brief look and find ones that are quite different to ones that we've already addressed.
Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, do you think that peer support for people with diabetes should be determined by the type of diabetes a person has or the life stage that they are living or a little bit of both? My answer to that would be it's really up to you what you feel like you need. Um, and the diabetes organisations and your healthcare providers can only give what they think what they think you need. And if you have a need that is different to what is on offer, then I suggest that you tell them about it. If you would prefer to be involved in um, a group or a diabetes clinic that is consistent with your life stage as opposed to as opposed to your diagnosis, then speak up about that because that might very well be possible. It's just that you need to make people around you know that that is your preference. So I'm going to answer just one last question because we're getting very close to 8 o'clock now. And I know you all want to have a bit of a break before you go off to, your, um, to the OzDoc tweet chat. Um, there are... It's a question here about working in aged care that I think I will end with. I work in aged care and some of the staff I talk to say that type 2 is food and medication and type 1 is insulin. Can we get the word out about what type 1 and type 2 really are? I think this comes down to, again, that level of energy that you have for educating the people around you. If you have the energy for that and the patience for that, then it will be really helpful for these other people working in aged care um, to understand that people with type 2 diabetes often do use insulin and that type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition and that um, people with type 2 diabetes sometimes can't manage their diabetes just with food and um, with dietary choices and medication and this is not and just because people with type 2 diabetes might start using insulin, that does not mean that they've failed in their diabetes management. This is a progressive condition and sometimes as time goes on, we need more and more intensive treatments. And so um, perhaps helping them understand that type 2 can progress to a point where the management and the treatment actually looks very similar to someone with type 1 diabetes. But the onus is really going to be on you in this instance. But Perhaps in, in that kind of setting, if you're working in that aged care or healthcare setting, asking Diabetes Australia Vic, to come in and, and work with the people that you, that you work with and helping them do some education or bringing in some of the resources that Diabetes Australia Vic produce like pamphlets and brochures and things and having them available um, as part of the staff training would be really helpful because my impression is that in this instance, not only are these misconceptions affecting you, their colleague, they're probably also affecting the people that they're caring for. Many of these older people probably do have type 2 diabetes and we know that in um, care facilities, type 2 diabetes is really overrepresented. So um, that could be really useful both for their professional development and for your um, collegial relationships with them. So thank you so much for your questions. Those are great questions and I can really see that everyone's um, yeah, just thinking through some of uh, these issues really well and I'm sorry I haven't been able to get to everything. Um, thank you so much for taking part in the webinar today. Um, thank you for having me. I'm going to pass you over to Angela again just to wrap things up. Okay, and um, thank you very much, um, Jessica, for um, the presentation tonight. And um, I know every time we do hear um, you speak on, on something like this, um, we all, well, I know I certainly learn more and um, have a different way of looking at things. And hopefully a lot of you will feel um, empowered to, to do something and to challenge the stigma that, that you do um, meet and that you've told us that you meet. Um, I will actually be sending out an email in the next couple of days, um, hopefully with a link to this. For um, I'm sure there was a lot of um, information covered today, so you will be able to access that again. Um, we will also include um, a short survey, and we really would appreciate it if you would help us by filling that in. Um, obviously, that will help us uh, to set topics for future webinars and we really want this to be something that you're interested in. Um, please, please um, 
if you are interested in support groups, my contact details will be on that email. Um, get in touch with me. I know many of you have, and we'll be putting um, a lot of work in the next few weeks into contacting you, and we hope we want to get as many support groups going as we can, and that's not only in Melbourne, but also in country Victoria as well. So, as I said, my contact details will be on the email. Please get in touch with me with any ideas you may have. Um, we also want this to be a two-way street, so if anything at all crops up that you think we could be looking at that would help you, please just drop me an email or give me a telephone call. In the meantime, thank you very much for participating and thank you for all the fantastic questions. And um, we look forward to being in touch and look forward to giving you the webinar to have as a future resource. Good night. Thanks. Bye.